There's no nation of Kurdistan. It is simply a region that overlaps parts of Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey borders. There is no nation, but there certainly should be. The United States has always resisted the idea because it wanted to appease the governments in Iraq and Turkey. The Kurds in eastern Turkey want independence. An actual nation of Kurdistan just south of the Turkish border might create even more unrest among Turkey's Kurdish population. For the same reason, Turkey doesn't want the United States to arm the Kurds. It might make them a threat to Turkey in the future. Until this week, the United States has refused to aid the Kurds except by going through Baghdad. But since last year, the predominantly Shia government in Baghdad has refused to send anything to the Kurds. They're fearful just like Turkey. Ironically, the only thing keeping ISIS occupied in the north instead of marching on Baghdad is the Peshmerga, as the fighting force of the Kurds is known. And the only thing between Turkey and ISIS is Kurdistan. Finally, senior U.S. officials announced on Monday that the United States would begin to send arms directly to the Kurds, and Iraq and Turkey should thank them for it. ISIS has tons of weapons and other war materials captured from U.S. armed Iraqi soldiers who fled. The Kurds have no weapons to match them, yet they are fiercely pro-American. They're well-organized and courageous fighters. They've been losing battles to ISIS because, as Fox News analyst Charles Krauthammer said, they're essentially using javelins and harpoons. They're the world's best bet for stopping ISIS before it turns into something huge that will involve everyone. The president has already ruled out the use of U.S. ground forces, but it takes ground forces to get the job done. The Iraqi military will be on the ground, but it has proven weak and untrustworthy. The Kurds have been valiant warriors, but need help. I believe we should fully arm them and give them all the air support they need, not the measly pinpoint strikes the president has authorized. President Obama has been looking for moderate Muslims. The Kurds are as moderate as Muslims get. They are mostly Sunni Muslim, but other Kurds are Shiites, Christians, and Jews. And yet amazingly, they all get along with the Kurds. You don't find that in any other Muslim rule group. Most Kurdish Christians are recent converts. They're evangelical, and so far, they seem welcome in the diverse community. When you look at images of the refugees in Kurdistan, it's helpful to look not just at the people, but into the background. You see them gathered in a massive, well-designed, and potentially beautiful, unfinished buildings. That's part of a building boom in Kurdistan. In other shots, you see large, well-maintained, and landscaped highways. The Kurds have successfully created a thriving economy. Most Americans are not opposed to military action when it's needed, as long as it's only military action, not endless nation building. The Kurds are successfully building their own nation. They need weapons, air support, and that's it. Until last week, the United States refused to do anything to stop ISIS. The president wanted to use fear of ISIS as a way to influence internal Iraqi politics. He doesn't think the Shia government has been inclusive enough. That's rather ironic coming from a president whose signature accomplishment, Obamacare, passed Congress in 2010 without a single Republican vote. ISIS has thrived in part because it has been treated by the Obama administration as if it were a rightfully aggrieved political party and not a terror army bent on subjugating the world to its will. President Obama, in announcing the bombing and relief efforts, said, once Iraq has a new government, the United States will work with it and other countries in the region to provide increased support to deal with this humanitarian crisis and counter-terrorism challenge. Secretary of State John Kerry said, the only durable way to stop ISIL is for Iraq 
real leaders to unite and form an inclusive government as rapidly as possible. But here's the deal, folks. Inclusiveness doesn't matter to ISIS. They don't want to be a place at the table in Iraq's government. They're building a caliphate. They want their man to rule the world. To us, this is not a holy war, but to them, it is. That means that the premise of this administration is wrong. They think it's about politics, but it is so much more than that. Christians in America need to remember Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 through 13. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. In the Hall of Fame, in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, for those who showed great examples of faith, the writer tells about the faith of various individuals in the Old Testament, then metaphorically throws up his hands. He says, there's too much to say, too many stories to tell. He said the time would fail him to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. He didn't even face the time constraints of a modern television program, but he perfectly expresses how I've been feeling lately. To use the words of scripture, time would fail me to tell of a new outbreak of pestilence with the Ebola virus putting the world on alert. The breathtaking rise in the persecution and displacement and genocide of Christians around the world the return of George W. Bush's axis of evil as Iraq goes back into the bad guy column with Iran and North Korea, and the return of Ronald Reagan's evil empire, an expression he used to describe the Soviet Union. I don't have the time to talk about the new belligerence of Vladimir Putin and the reckless gamesmanship he has displayed in just the last few days in his personal war with Barack Obama. Some of you remember when the majority of the human race lived less than a half an hour away from nuclear annihilation. Well, here we go again. We're there again. The world seems less safe than at any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis, and most Americans don't even know it. ISIS matters. We don't know yet if the present developments are a big step or a small one, but we already know the direction it's heading toward Armageddon. When you hear a report like this, it's easy to fret. Fox News commentator Sean Hannity often quotes from John 14, where Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. That's good advice, and I appreciate anyone willing to quote scripture on a national television show. But it's good to remember that after Jesus gave his admonition, he explained why we don't need to let our hearts be troubled. He gave us something to build our hope on. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus gave a dire prophecy, then coupled it with wonderful news. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Followers of Jesus have the best retirement plan the world has to offer. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you have a future so bright and golden, words can't express it. And if you aren't a follower of Jesus, you can be right now. Even in troubled times, you can know the joy and peace of resting easy and the one who has overcome the world. You know, as I said in my book, Combat Faith, it says something that I want to leave you with. It says, therefore, let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering into his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word heard, 
did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. This is talking about the Israelites when they were coming out of Egypt and they were at the Red Sea and they continued in it. You see, God said we should fear him. And the other thing he says in the word of God is you should fear failing to claim his promises that were given to you to give you peace and rest in time of the worst things going on in the world. Therefore, learn the promises that account for helping you in whatever you need and are experiencing. Don't fail to claim the promises of God and counting them as more real than the things you see with your eyes and hear with your ears. Claim those promises. Learn them. You're going to need them. Well, that's it for the night, folks. And God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsey.com or call one 888 Rapture.